Paul's their dearest friend. All that he said, now he was dead. So this was the way it would end. The dreams they had dreamed were not what they seemed. Now that he was dead and gone, the garden, the jail, the hammer, the nail, how could a night be so long? Then came the morning. Let us all stand as we begin, uh, con sorry, continue and worship Hosanna in the highest as the uh, kids are going to do their parade. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with our hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord our God. Hosanna in the highest. Glory, glory, glory. Glory to the King of Kings. Glory, glory, glory to the King of Kings. Lord, we lift up your name. Lift our hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord our God. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, 
Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Oh, Lord, we lift up your name with our hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, our God. Hosanna in the highest. Glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Lord, we lift up your name with a heart full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, our God. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Amen. Hosanna in the highest. Lamb of glory. Precious Lamb of glory. story from God's word that kings and priests and prophets heard there would be a sacrifice and blood would flow to pay sin's price precious lamb of glory love's most wondrous story heart of God's redemption of man worship the Lamb of glory on the cross God loved the world while all the powers of hell Worship the Lamb of Glory as we approach this time of Easter and His sacrifice and all that He did on the cross, on the old rugged cross. There He paid for our sins and died because of His great love. When I survey the wondrous cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died by riches gain I count but loss and poor content on all His hands, his feet, 
sorrow and love flowed me go down did ever such love oh and sorrow me oh thorns can pull so rich a crown were the whole so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all because that's what jesus gave his life all of it for us the old rugged cross suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for the world of lost sinners was slain so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay Cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left His glory above to bear into dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died To pardon, to sanctify me So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to a home far away where his glory forever I'll share. Though I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. 
I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a Father, we there is our prayer this morning, Lord, that you will help us just cling to the cross through this busy world and no matter what's going on in our life, that we will just cling to the cross and Jesus who was on the cross, Lord, who died and not only died to pay for our sins, but rose again. Lord, we just thank you that we serve and worship a living and active God who's here amongst us with us this morning. We just thank you for that, Lord that the trophies of this world that we think are, this, are trophies of this world, Lord, that, we will, that they will be pushed away, Lord, and that you will be our ultimate trophy, Lord. Jesus of Nazareth, the Lord God Almighty in the flesh. We just thank you for who you are and for your spirit amongst us and what you're doing in and through us. We just give you praise and glory. Hosanna in the highest. To your name be the glory, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you all. You may be seated. Okay. We have a video we want to show at this time because next Sunday, if you remember last Sunday, we opened up the worship service with a worship song with worship leaders from all over the world. Well, next Sunday, we're receiving the Easter offering, and today we want to give you just a snapshot of where missions is happening around the world when you give toward missions next Sunday. Go ahead, you ladies. Nazarene Missions is a movement of God through the people of God. Today, we are part of a global movement that seeks to flood a world that needs a compassion that restores with the love and peace of Christ. Nazarene Missions provides a wide range of compassionate ministries that have great reach, impact, and longevity through hospitals and clinics, responding to disasters, and sending work and witness teams to build new churches, Nazarene Missions provides various resources so that Nazarenes around the world can impact and transform their local community. This helps us develop and equip each church to be effective in ministry and global evangelism. We believe that evangelism is sharing the good news of the Lord. The power of the gospel of Christ through the witness of the Holy Spirit brings people closer and brings about the transformation of their heart and life. For this reason, Nazarene Missions prayerfully sends missionaries to pioneer areas where they participate in the movement of the Holy Spirit to bring salvation and restoration. This makes it possible for each congregation to become a self-sustaining member of the denomination that will thrive in its own context for generations to come. Education promotes sustainability. Our purpose is effectively fulfilled when our churches have the knowledge they need to prosper. Nazarene Missions helps provide training, education, and resources to support our local Nazarene churches around the world, equipping them through discipleship and leadership development. All of this is made possible thanks to the generous and sacrificial offerings of people and churches all over the world. Today, we invite you to be part of this global movement to continue making Christ-like disciples all around the world. Nazarene Missions is a movement of God through the people of God. I just love it. And many of you have been on mission trips before and helped build buildings. Two-thirds, over two-thirds of all those that claim to be Nazarenes are worshiping today in other parts of the world. Uh, to me, that's the answer. I know we need a strong military. We need to be politically savvy. More than anything, we need to have the kingdom of God at work, and that's what's happening as we give. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. 
At this time, ushers, are we ready to receive the offering? Ushers? Wonderful. Would you pray for the offering, Greg, yes, please? Sir. Thank you. Dear Jesus, Lord. Were no larger than a tear. The sound of his voice made dry land appear. He sculpted the mountains with such a great skill. Yet when he made it was more than just a
thirsty and dry as he cried it is finished all heaven stood still yet when he thanked Calvary it was more than I was condemned, but he took my place. You see, I was in sin, but my sin he erased. He prayed for him while his blood spilled. As he cried, it is finished, all heaven stood still, yet when he found it was more than just a hill. On a hill far away stood an old that say amen. Amen. amen wow wow amazing you know we are so blessed when i hear larry sing and when i hear lorraine on the offertory and our worship team all these wonderful volunteers that give of themselves you know it would be a pretty boring limited church if it was just me but i'm so grateful for all of you I thought as Lorraine was playing, it was years back that, uh, and she doesn't want people to know this, but in honor or in memory of her mother, as well as her mother-in-law, her and Steve bought this as well as another piano just like this that's at their home. So she practices and then brings her talent here to the church, and what a gift it is. Thank you, Lorraine, and thank you, Larry, and worship team. It just... Uh, I hope that captures your heart, what's been happening this morning, you know? We were together there in the first hour, and I just love the fellowship. You know, it's almost like we like each other, you know? It's just, it's a good thing. And the next Sunday, we're going to do it again, and it's going to be fun. At 9 o'clock, Pastor Dan's going to bring the word. About 9.45, we'll have breakfast. If you're not an early riser, but you can make it for breakfast at 9.45, and then we'll be in here at 10.15. It's just going to be a great, great week, and I hope that you are able to capture everything that is meant to be captured this week. Don't let this week just slip by. This is Holy Week. Amen. It's an exciting week, and don't let anything distract you from what the Lord wants to do this week. Does anybody just have a quick word of praise before we get into the Word? Just a word of praise for Jesus. Some of you are smiling at me like you got something.
Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 I'm a man that takes a chainsaw and a big hammer and I go out with old rugged stuff. Johnny Ellis will let us find stuff. Praise the business, Lord, and the old rugged cross. I love the old rugged cross. Amen. Amen. I'm glad as a country boy, well, as a country old man, I'm glad to be here today at the T Road here at Harris County. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Oh. And the children. Kevin, you were getting up, sir. Praise God. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Taylor, were you and Randy going to say something? Let's just pray right now. Jesus, we do pray for Kathy's family. We're so grateful for what you've done in her yes. brother's life and allowing him to get into this treatment. And we do pray for this other relative as well, Pam. We just pray, Jesus, that you would have your hand continually on this family. Yes. We're excited how Randy Murphy and Nanette were just baptized here recently, Lord, and what you're doing in their lives. Just continue to bring a revival throughout that family and touch this family member and Father, we breathe that prayer over all of our families today, Lord. As we walk through this week, if there's anyone we know that just needs to know Jesus, may this week be the opportune time for the conversation, for the open door, for the decision to follow Jesus. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Taylor. Amen. Have you got your Bibles this morning? If not, there's one in the pew. Matthew chapter 21 is where we're going to be. I love parades. I don't know. If, to me, I've always loved parades ever since I was a kid. There was the homecoming parade there on Pine Street in Rolla, Missouri. During St. Patrick's time, the engineering school there in Rolla, they made some of the best floats you can imagine. I remember as I grew up and moved away and we'd watch different parades on TV like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade or the Rose Bowl Parade on New Year's, I'd say, you know, they've got floats like that back in Rolla, Missouri that the engineering students made. Parades. 
I love parades. We recently were watching an old family movie, one of those on the little eight millimeter projector. As it was clicking through, they showed a parade that took place in front of Grandma and Grandpa's house in Bon Terre, Missouri. Back in that day, everybody was in the parade. It's almost like Bluebird days, you know? Everybody was in the parade. You had cars, you had trucks, you had tractors, you had horses, you had the Shriners in their little, whether they were on a motorcycle or some little miniature car, everybody was in the parade. Went out to Frontier Days in Cheyenne, Wyoming, even the governor, the Supreme Court, and all the state officers rode horses in the parade in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Parades. I love parades. We find that happening here in Matthew chapter 21. It's a parade. In my Bible, the title is The Triumphal Entry, and it was a celebration. I've been there, and some of you have been to that spot as you come down from the Mount of Olives on into Jerusalem, and you think about what was happening that day. Let's read about it together, if you'll follow along in, Mac, in Matthew chapter 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus said to two disciples, go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks anything of you, tell him that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. I want you to think about that phrase, the Lord needs them. The Lord needs them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt. They placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him, and those shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And now we get into the heart of the message. Jesus entered the temple area, drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple. He healed them. But the chief priests and the teachers of law when they saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna, son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus said. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You have ordained praise. And he left them and went out of the city, to the, uh, the city of Bethany where he spent the night. Now the focus last week was moving the morgue. You remember that? I was all excited to see that article from Allegheny County. And to know in Pittsburgh, back in the day in the late 20s, a century ago, they were moving this multi-story, 6,000-ton block building, stone building, and they kept working in that thing while they moved it from this location to that location. I was grateful for my neighbor, Mitty, who brought a, an article about the Bell Telephone Building in downtown Indianapolis. Back about the same time, they moved that building. They actually just pivoted that thing, and that was a much taller building. And they kept working in that while well, they did it. And the whole theme of last Sunday's sermon was this. If God can give guys and ladies the mind, the ability to move buildings like that, just think of what he can do in your life and my life. Amen. And the scripture just said this. If you have faith, the faith of a mustard seed, if you have faith and do not doubt, whatever you ask in prayer, it will happen. You can say to this mountain, throw yourself into the ocean, it will do it. To me, that was just a beautiful snapshot, and it's right here, just beyond what we read this morning. It's a beautiful snapshot of what God wants to do on a larger scale, but also in your life as well. This morning, we're going to back up and look at this. And the title of the sermon I want to give you this morning is Clearing the Temple. Clearing the Temple. We read the scripture. The palm branches were being waved just like this morning. The kids were excited here. I loved it when they went by and they gave me high fives, and it was such a celebration. That's life, folks. That's life. Sometimes I know kids can, can maybe cry a little bit in the service or be a little crazy, but that's a sign of life. Amen. 
sometimes I talk to my mom and she, she'll, she'll kind of just reluctantly say, well, in our church, we don't have any children. In our church, we don't have any teens. We have one teen. He lights the, the candles on the, on, the, on the communion table at the beginning of church and, and now he's going off to college. So we're, we're just so blessed. And I don't say that to brag. I just say that to be grateful yes, for all the youth and all the children we have. Right. And there they were that day, waving, waving, waving. But if you look carefully, right before that parade, and I pointed out in the scripture, Jesus sends two of his disciples to get the donkey and the colt. And he says this, the father has need of them. The father had a purpose for those two animals. The father had a purpose to send the disciples. And somehow the father even worked on the mind of that person who owned those animals to let Jesus and his disciples borrow those animals. One of the things I love about our study, Experiencing God, is just that reminder that God is always at work behind the scenes. He really is. And I loved what we talked about this morning. Nancy brought it out so well. We want to look for those opportunities during the, during the week to have those encounters with people. We never know who we're going to run into and the conversation we're going to have and what God is going to do. And he just says right here, Jesus says, the Father has need of them. By the end of the message, I hope you will understand this is for you. This day, this week, every day, the Lord has need of you. You know, sometimes we tell that to kids as they're growing up and we'll just say, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And they get on to middle school and high school and we just pray that God will help, help them surrender their hearts to Jesus and start living for Jesus and start making Jesus decisions. And from time to time, we have those that are called into ministry. Two weekends from right now, Jeremiah Bullock will be here and, and we'll be having revival. My God was faithful to speak into Jeremiah's heart. But don't forget this. It's not just the kids, the middle schoolers, the high schools. It's you too. Right. It's you too. It's you. So I, I, we had some time with mom this week, and I just tried to take time to pour that into her. She's 87 years old. She's, she's just all over the place. She's going to church. She's going to Sunday school. She goes to a midweek Bible study. They have twice a week exercise. She's, she's got another Bible study she goes to. She's just all over the place. And I'm just like, God is using... Just like this donkey and colt, God has need of you. Yes, amen. Don't forget that. He has need for each of us. And maybe think about that Wednesday night. I like what Nancy said a while ago as we were together next door. You remember she said, she said, when you get here, just understand there may be people here you don't even know that, that you can connect with on Wednesday night. So come for a great time. But anyway, the donkey was needed. The prophecy was fulfilled. And the crowd is shouting, Hosanna, which means God save us. They knew there was something going on. They knew that God was on the scene and they were so excited about what was happening. And in verse 10, it says, everybody was all stirred up. Isn't that interesting? The whole city was stirred. What does that mean? In the original language, it's a passive present participle. Oh, isn't that exciting? It's a passive present participle. And it's in the aorist tense. If that doesn't do it for you, the aorist tense should put you over the top into shouting ground. But basically what he's saying here is the town was shaken. The town was agitated. The town was trembling. The, to the town was quaking. The town was filled with fear. All the people who live there, and in the original language, what it means is something from the outside was doing something on their inside and it was really a strong, strong urge. It wasn't like when you're driving along and somebody comes the other way and says, hey, did you see that car? No, I didn't see it. Well, and the car is gone. I'm talking about these people were, they were, they were just shaken. The whole city was just shaken. It was kind of like when Jesus was born and Herod was shaken and all the people around were shaken. This was the same thing happening here. They wanted to know what's going on. What's happening? And so they were certainly on high alert. And so what happens? Jesus goes into the temple and he cleanses or clears the temple. Now I've got a couple of handouts. I'm not going to give them to you now. But after the service, one of these handouts is for home group. And Deb does a great job putting those together. And it's, it's this set. That'll be at the back when we're done. And then there's another one. It's about just Jesus going to the temple. 
And I copied off some stuff from Barnes, who's one of the great Bible commentators that talks all about the temple, if you want to dig further into that, about the temple. But Jesus goes in, and he'd been to Jerusalem before. In fact, this takes place at the end of Matthew. At the beginning of John, Jesus does the same thing. But here he is in Matthew. And he'd seen the sights before, but he didn't do anything. But now, as he's going to Jerusalem as Messiah... And he knows in his heart and mind how all this is going to happen, how it's all going to play out. And in his heart and mind, he's like, this is the time. I've seen this before. And it's not that I just let it go before and I'm upset now. He was, he was concerned all along. It wasn't the fact that he reached a boiling point. This was just the, 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 the story coming together, the story being played out. It says in Malachi, the Lord whom you shall see suddenly come to his temple. He will purify the sons of Levi. And this is what Jesus came to do when he came to the temple. He found those who were selling oxen, sheep, pigeons. He found the money changers at their business. It says in John, he made a a whip of cords, drove them out with the sheep and the oxen. And he said, take these things away. You will not make my father's house into a house of trade. Now, now sometimes, and I, I, I want to open a can of worms, but not real big, okay? Just a little bit, okay? Because sometimes in the life of the church, in our, in our eagerness, in our zeal to preserve this thing, this sanctuary, this, this gathering place, we, we've kind of just, we've been very concerned and, and we've, sometimes I've even known people that have taken this scripture and said, well, you know, that's why, that's why you shouldn't eat at church. I mean, we, we've had people in the past that we, we were at a church somewhere in another state and they, they wouldn't even have a fellowship dinner at the church because they said, you don't go to church to eat. You know, you go to church to worship. Of course you go to church to worship. I'm not taking away from worship. And I, I know there have been times like, well, you know, do you think, is it, is it possible if the kids are raising money for camp or something, should we really talk about that at church? Because that's not what church is about. Or if we have a special speaker come or a special musician, is it okay that they sell their stuff out there? Because the Bible, the Bible, the Bible says. I, I'm so grateful that as I quickly close that can of worms, because some of you, many of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've all heard your parents talk about this. You're like, why is he off on that tangent? The reason I'm off on that tangent is because that's not what Jesus is talking about here. What Jesus is talking about is this is a place of worship. Now, like I said, sometimes there may be a kid that gets loose and runs up and down the aisle or wants to come up and hit a drum or, or touch the keyboard or something like that. We're, we're not against that at all. We're, we're not against that at all. It's this idea, it's this function, it's this, this thought that, that all through the week my life is a place of worship. My life is a house of worship. And I come here with others who are worshiping in that way too. The one thing I believe, I believe the one thing Jesus was telling them about this place was whatever you do at this place, don't forget me. Jesus talking about himself. And make sure that I am the focus, you know, because God is a jealous God. He wants to be honored. He wants to be praised. And so what he's saying here and, and what he's looking at here is, please remember the heart of what you do in the midst of everything else. And I don't know about you. I've been part of churches. They've had, we, back in the days of Sunday school contests, there used to be a contest in the spring and a contest in the fall. And, and I'll never forget, when we were in college, we were at a church. I'll just tell you where it is because it's not even, I don't think it's even there anymore. It was right there in Bethany, Oklahoma. It's the War Acres Church of the Nazarene, just down the road from the, from the college. And at War Acres Church of the Nazarene, one time we had a Sunday school contest. And we took the church and we divided it in half. And we said, okay, we're going to have the saints against the apostles. And here's what we're going to do. And they had the platform, I mean, the platform, the sanctuary was there about twice the size, and they had the platform loaded. And and they had bicycles, and they had all kinds of other toys. And this thing was just loaded. It's like, okay. And and the pastor's wife, she got in a cheerleading outfit, and she was going to be cheering for the saints. And the Sunday school superintendent's wife, she got in a cheer outfit, and she was going to be cheering for the apostles. And it's like, we love Jesus. Yes, we do. And we're going to invite all these people, and they're going to find, well, there's, that was fun, you know. I, I don't know how many people came to Jesus. It was just a lot of fun. And that didn't bother me. 
I just thought these middle or upper age women in cheerleading outfits was just a little bit sad. Okay, can I just be honest, okay? Oh, it's kind of sad. And I would have felt the same way if it would have been guys, you know? Whew. But anyway, I go back, I go back. But here's the thing, it doesn't, that's, that's not, don't get distracted by that. Don't get distracted by that. What Jesus is saying, remember this, remember this, the temple in your heart and in your life, and we're going to get there in just a minute. What is that focus? What is that all about? See, John talked about in the Gospel of John at the Passover feast, and it was tradition that people didn't just come to the temple and say, okay, it's Passover, we're going to have this. They would actually spend days before the Passover feast to meticulously go through their house, and they wanted to make sure there was nothing, yeast or any other substance, that would cause fermentation. They wanted to make sure that it was cleansed from their home. They wanted to make sure that they were ready for the Passover. The city was given over to cleansing every single house. And now Jesus comes to the temple and says, whoa, what's going on here? They've gotten distracted. They've gotten distracted. Do we ever get distracted? The confusion, the clutter, the noise, the smells. And it was custom. It was custom that, that, that there were animals there for people to bring. And, and if they didn't bring, if they were coming from a long journey, or if they didn't have an unblemished animal, they could buy one there. It, but the problem was that got out of hand. The word extortion. Aren't you glad extortion doesn't happen anymore? You know, but the word extortion was a word that Jesus probably used in that day. So wait a minute, you can buy that dove outside for maybe 10 cents, but inside right here where it's the place where the priest gets ready to go and offer a sacrifice, you're charging $10. That's not right. That's not right. And I'm trying to imagine in my mind what it looked like because scholars tell us that Jerusalem in the first century during this time Today, the city is about 850 or 60,000 people. In that day, it could swell to 2 million people. I can't imagine what that looks like because 860,000 is a lot in this day. But in that day, over 2 million people coming. And it turned into a mess. And Jesus says, the problem is this. It's much like in the book of Revelation where it says, you've forgotten your first love. That's the problem. So what does he do? He goes in and clears out the temple. He clears out the temple. Now, let's go back to the beginning. The Lord have need, has need of this goat, this donkey, this colt, whatever. The Lord has need of us. But the question is this, are we going to allow him, and this is where my heart is today for this sermon, are we going to allow him to clear out us? Are we going to allow, see the problem is in this new day in which we live, we're the temple. Paul says that. You and I are the temple. We're the body of Jesus. We're the place where he dwells. Sure, he dwells here too. I prayed this morning as you came in, he would be dwelling here. But is he dwelling in you and is he dwelling in me? I think about in the Blackaby study where this guy had a person who was so upset on his board and stormed out. And he went and he talked to him and says, do you have an, an unwavering, deep commitment to Jesus? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? And the guy just broke down. See, that's the thing. The Lord wants to fill this temple. He wants to fill you. He wants to fill me. And my prayer this week as we get ready to go through Holy Week is that we will look for any opportunity for him to come in and cleanse us out, to clear us out. Amen. It's springtime. It's spring cleaning. Now, I'm not talking about just throwing away clothes you haven't been able to fit in for the last five years. Or maybe they're out of style and they came back in and now they're out again and you just like it's time to get rid of these clothes. It's kind of funny, mom and dad, we looked at an old video of, of them at their 40th anniversary. They were married close to 67 years. And mom said, I've got that same purse. Look, it's right over there. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about getting in trend with the styles. I'm not talking about getting rid of the junk in your house. I'm talking about us. Are we allowing the creator of the universe to cleanse us from the inside out? Are we stirred like those people were stirred up? Are we stirred up on the inside and saying, you know what, Lord, you got to do something in me. That's what it's all about. The sacrifice was to be spotless. How about you and me? A glorious church without spot or wrinkle. There's an old song in the hymnal says, 
washed in the blood of the Lamb. And I like when Larry said a while ago, the fact that this cross doesn't just come and just, it's not just about Jesus, it's about cleansing away me, the sin in me, changing me. And it may be something as minor as grudges or attitudes or unforgiveness. Could be something a little more major. They're all really the same thing. Secret sins, addictions, or maybe we're just stuck, you know? I can never forgive that person, what they did to me, what they did to me. Well, the problem is they may not even know what's happened. It's been so long ago, and life goes on. I love the story. You probably have heard me tell it before. There was a, a father down in Mexico. He was getting on in life, and he didn't have much longer to live, and he, had, he was just kind of allowing the Lord to work in his heart and life. And he was feeling convicted because he'd lost out on a relationship with his son. They had been estranged for decades. He knew he didn't have long to live, and he wanted to connect with his son one more time. And this was kind of the cleansing moment in his life because the Lord just convicted him. You've got to get it right. You've got to get it right. And he didn't even know how to reach his son. This was before the days of social media. So he went to the local newspaper. He says, I just need to take out a, just a, like a one-sentence ad. Paco, all is forgiven. Meet me at the city square tomorrow at noon. That's all he said. Paco, all is forgiven. Meet me at the city square tomorrow at noon. The next day, the little old man goes to the city square. There were 300 kids there (laughs) named Paco. (laughs) Wouldn't it be great if somebody just walked into your life and just said, hey, all is forgiven? Well, the good news is that's what we're here for. That's what this is all about. There's somebody that walks into our lives and says, all is forgiven. And every day I pray that prayer, Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Forgive me, Lord, as I forgive others. And that's what this is all about. As Jesus goes in to clean out the temple and cleanse the temple, sure, there were birds and other livestock there, but the biggest lesson Jesus was teaching that day was cleaning out the hearts of those people because their hearts had gotten distracted. And I know it's easy for us. It's easy for me. We're checking the news the other night at mom's house and the three headlines are tornadoes in Mississippi, problems in Israel, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, and the shooting that took place in Nashville. And that's enough to just make you say, whoa, is there any hope at all? And in the midst of that, there's a message that needs to go out that God wants to move in your life and my life to clear out the temple, to clear out the temple. There needs to be something that goes on in our lives, and I think this is matters the most. There's got to be something that happens in your life and my life that makes us different than people around us. Is our conversation different than those around us? You know, because, because what happens is when Jesus cleans the temple, when he cleanses the temple, there's something different about us. We don't have those conversations that other people have, about how we hate this and hate that, and this is wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. I think there's a whole different mindset. In fact, it talks about that in Romans. There's a whole different mindset that takes us over that says, you know what? I want to have the mind of Jesus. Like I said a while ago, Jesus had been to this temple many times. And it was at this time, he says, okay, this is when everything is is all lining up, prophecy to be fulfilled, Holy Week, this happens. But I'm just asking us this morning, are we allowing him to cleanse us? Is there something different about us? I can't remember how much of the story I told last week, probably most of it, but I'll just kind of give you the leftover part about this whole water testing thing we do at the church. Did I tell that story last week? Well, the water testing that happens here at Harris Chapel, uh, every quarter we're supposed to take a sample. And when we take these samples, we send them into IDE, well, we send them into the place right across from Max on the Galliard right there. We send it to HML, and they run the test. We get the results, and it goes to IDEM, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. And so what happens was, first time we did it, no problem. Quarter comes along, next quarter, problem. We have this stuff that shows up in the water. And it's not good, and I don't even know what the stuff is. It just says it's coliform present. I don't know if coliform means it's cancer-causing agents, or if it means rust, or if it means algae, or what it means, but coliform present means you fail the test. 
And so when you fail the test, not only do you have to turn around and test again, you've got to test four different sites and the home site. So you've got to go to the well, and there, 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 there. And there was this sweet lady, and her name's Carolyn. And Carolyn is kind of like a... Do we have anybody in here named Karen this morning? You've heard about Karens? Okay, all right. But if you're, if you're a Karen, she's not like you. She's like the Karen that's the stereotypical Karen, okay? But anyway, so this Carolyn comes, and she's just, it's not good, it's not good. And I've talked to her at different times, and I talked to the people that come, I said, folks, I said, I'm not trying to be nasty about this. I said, I, I love people here. I like to visit people. I like to do life with people. I like to preach. I like to pray. I like to worship. I just don't do water samples. I really, I don't. I'm not, I'm not mad at you. I know it's your job. I know it's what you have to do, but I don't do water samples. And they're like, we understand, Pastor. If you have somebody else that can do it, well, I'm the one that's here on the property most, so I'll do it, and on and on and on. But it's kind of this bantering back and forth. And, and sure enough, we've had racers out here at different times to clean the well, to bleach the well, to all different kinds of things, add different devices on the well, new, new faucets next door, all these different things. And, and finally now, finally now, we're getting clean samples, you know. I'm like, good, good. Now we have to do it every month for a year because we've been bad and all that. But anyway, because during COVID, we, we didn't report because we didn't meet. And when we did meet, we just bottled water. Long story. Anyway, about a week and a half ago, I got under conviction. I have been harboring bad feelings toward Carolyn. I did. I just like that's not right. I can't do it. I can't behave like that toward Carolyn. And so what I did was I, I just, out of conviction, I just sat down and wrote an email. I wrote it to Carolyn and then to anybody else I had emails for in the IDM office, you know. I just said, I was wrong. Please forgive me. You all do a wonderful job. Have a great week. I didn't try to apologize, say, well, you know, it's not my job. I don't do water samples. I didn't try to make excuses. See, sometimes with apologies, we try to make excuses, you know. Carolyn, I want you to know how much I really hated you in the past. But God convicted me that I shouldn't hate you anymore, so I don't hate you. And the way you say it, you know, it's like you're just... It's like, wait a minute, where's forgiveness, you know? But it's like God was just saying, hey, Jim, you got to let that go in your life. Right. Now, I didn't hear back from anybody at the IDM. I don't need to. I don't need to. I just needed to do that, you know? I was wrong. I don't need to explain how I thought I should be wrong or what happened. I just, I was wrong. You ever do that with an apology? Try that with your spouse sometime. <laughs> just try that, you know? Because sometimes apologies don't work right. They just, they, they turn into another argument, you know? <laughs> you wouldn't believe how long I was so upset about the way you did this and the way you did that. But God told me I needed to stop and apologize to you. Wait a minute, did she even know or did he even know they did this and did this? And I, they don't need to know the backstory. All they need to hear is, I was wrong. Can you say that with me? I was wrong. Now, some of you just said you were wrong. No, 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 no. Let's, let's, start, let's start that again. Ready? One, two, three. I was wrong. I love it. Rick Warren said one time, the best way to help end a fight with your spouse is start this way. Honey, I was so selfish in the way I behaved and what I said. I was wrong. Would you forgive me? Had that, what, 15 seconds? I was so selfish in the way I behaved. I was wrong. Would you forget? When you, in fact, when you call yourself out and call yourself selfish, that's all you have to do, just to release that thing. And that's what Jesus is coming into this temple situation. He's clearing out the temple. He's cleaning out the temple. And he wants to do that in us. Yeah, that's right. We're the ones that in a crazy world responding to disasters that happen all over the Midwest, the South, and wherever, the natural disasters that happen, to respond to Nashville, Tennessee, to respond to what's going on in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, and you fill in the blank with all these different things. We have to be the changed, cleansed people who walk in and say, you know what? God loves you. God has need of you. And that's my message for us this morning. How do we do that? Well, just two quick words and then we'll go. One word is wisdom. Wisdom. And knowing it's God's wisdom and not our wisdom. I love what Blackaby talked about yesterday. Wisdom is not what you know about the world. Wisdom is how well you know God. Wisdom is not what you know about the world. Well, I've lived long enough. I've seen enough. I know enough. That's not wisdom. 
Wisdom is what you know about God. How's your God wisdom? And then another thing is obedience. A shift in our world from wisdom of world to wisdom of God and a shift in our world from sacrifice. I hope you know how much I've sacrificed for you. That doesn't mean anything. Don't you love Grandma Walton? We love the Waltons. We're just into the Waltons. It's amazing. But anyway, that's not what it's about. The other word is obedience. The scripture says this, obedience is better than sacrifice. Saul missed it. He missed it back in 1 Samuel. He thought he would do this, this, and this, but not that. We'll defeat the enemy. We'll do everything that, but we'll keep some of the spoils. That always got them in trouble when they didn't follow all those directions. But let's wrap it up with this. What does God need to do in your life? Because he has need of you. He has need of me. What does he need to do in our lives so he can use us? What does he need to do in your life? Are there grudges? Are there attitudes? Is there unforgiveness? Is there secret sin? Are there addictions? Are you stuck? Let's stand together and have a word of prayer. Would you join me, please? I heard Tony Evans' daughter this week. I, I shared the video. I saw it maybe it was a week before, but anyway, she was talking about popcorn. And I didn't know this about popcorn. All I knew is you need some oil, some seasoning, and some hot, whatever, heat. But she said this, what happens is when popcorn heats up, there's like this little vapor or little moisture in the kernel on the inside that it causes it to explode. But see, a lot of times in life, there's that hard shell. When the heat comes on, the heat comes on, the heat, we just get harder and harder and harder. But cleansing the temple is going inside. It's an inside job. Let's pray about that. Would you join me this morning? Is there anything you'd like to come and pray about before we go? Uh, we'll have those sheets at the back, but when you leave for home groups and, and for more information about the temple, if you want to know about the in, in intricacies of the temple, it's a great study. But the main thing is this, God has need of you and God has need of me. That's why we're even here. It makes no difference whether we're children or teens or adults or senior adults. He has need of us. And the question is, is there anything he needs to cleanse in your temple today, in your life, so he can use you? Just that simple. Is there anything he needs to do so he can use you? And maybe you feel like there's no need for you. Just need to check in in prayer this morning. Just come to the altar and kneel and pray and just say, Lord, show, show me where you need me. And then, Lord, cleanse out my heart and my life so you can use me. Let's pray about that. You might want to join me at the altar. Feel free to join us. Amen. Dear Jesus, today as we're here, this is your house. This is your space. That word seems to be floating around a lot. This is your space. This is where you, we just ask you to help speak into us and move in our lives. And Lord, on this Palm Sunday, celebration day we know that it was also a day where you came in and cleared out the temple so i pray lord that you clear out our hearts and minds because you have need of us that father we would not be stuck that we would not be filled with unforgiveness that we would not be filled with spite and grudges in our lives that we would not look on the side that keeps track of all the wrongs but that lord you would we would say lord here i am Help me to see you. Help me to have wisdom, your wisdom, Lord. And help me to walk obediently with you, Jesus. That's what I need today, Jesus. Clean out my heart. Clean out my life. Cleanse me from the inside out. Cleanse me, Lord. May your Holy Spirit have right away in every area of my life. May your Holy Spirit have freedom. Have freedom to move. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your sweet presence in this service today. Through the worship, through the testimonies, through the word, may you continue to speak into us, Jesus. We pray that you'd meet these needs that are at the altar today and help each of us to know that we are needed. In the kingdom of God, in the work of God, we're needed. And help each of us to know, Lord, that you want to cleanse and use us, Lord. 
Use us as we walk through this week. Bless and minister in the great gathering on Wednesday night with all the kids and families that are here. Bless next Sunday, Jesus, as we come to worship you, Lord. As we come to worship you, may we worship with our whole hearts. And between now and then, especially maybe just right now, cleanse out anything, Lord, that's getting in the way. Anything, Jesus. We love you. We praise you. We bless you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're welcome to stay and pray. Those sheets will be available at the back of the sanctuary in the foyer. We're dismissed. Amen. <laughs>